Well, let me take a second and greet all of our City First Church locations online, our amazing Cape Coral crew, Spring Creek and State Line in the house. And of course, let's give it up for our God Behind Bars crew at Dixon and Hardy and on the Pando app. Well, I know we've already said it 50 times to you guys today, but happy Mother's Day one more time. To all the moms who are joining us, whether in the house or online, we celebrate you today. And we do have a free gift for everybody. Um, If you're in the house, it'll be available in the lobby on your way out. And if you are watching online, you'll see that there's a way to download a digital download. It's just our way of saying from your City First Church family that we love you very much. And we are in your corner and we see you today. Well, I also want to take a moment and... um, Just acknowledge that days like today can also be um, a little difficult and hold some heartache for some people. And I know maybe you're in this room and your mom struggled to kind of show you love and maybe there's a strained relationship or maybe you're in here today and and you've lost your mom and um, she's no longer here. So today has a sting for you. I just want you to know that your City First Church family, we love you and we see you and we're in your corner and we're praying for you. And then I also know that today, that especially in a room this size and with our online crowd, that there's some amazing women listening today who your journey to motherhood has been a lot different than what you had planned. And maybe that dream hasn't come true yet, or maybe you're in here and you've lost a child, and things just haven't gone the way you expected. And we just want to say to you today that we see you and that we honor you and that we love you and we pray, we're pray. praying for you and your City First Church family is in your corner. So in this house today, can we give it up for all the mama hearts in this house that you nurture and you give and you guide. And we are so grateful for you and everybody, all the ladies in the house, all the mama hearts in the house get to grab a gift on the way out. It's our way of saying thank you so much, and we love you so very much. And I am excited about the message today, excited to dive in, and we are going to be looking at a passage in Scripture uh, in Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17 in the New Testament, one of the Gospels. And if you have your Bible, you can take that out and follow along, Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. Guess what? The scripture's going to be up on the screen. So let's go ahead and dive in and read this story. It says this. It says, months later, the apostles returned from their ministry tour and told Jesus all the wonders and miracles they had witnessed. Jesus, wanting to be alone with the 12, quietly slipped away with them toward Bethsaida. But the crowds soon found out about it and took off after him. When they caught up with Jesus, he graciously welcomed them all, taught them more about God's kingdom realm, and healed all who were sick. As the day wore on, the twelve came to Jesus and told him, It's getting late. You should send the crowds away to the surrounding villages and farms to get something to eat and to find shelter for the night. There's nothing to eat here in the middle of nowhere. Jesus responded, You have the food to feed them. They replied, "Uh, Jesus, all we have are these five small loaves of bread and two dried fish. Do you really expect us to go buy food for all of these people? There are nearly 5,000 men here with women and children besides. He told the disciples, have them all sit down in groups of 50 each. After everyone was seated, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, and gazing into the heavenly realm, he gave thanks for the food. Then, in the presence of his disciples, he broke off pieces of bread and fish and kept giving more to each disciple to give to the crowd. It was multiplying before their eyes. So everyone ate until they were filled. They didn't just have a snack, until they were filled. And afterwards, the disciples gathered up the leftovers. It came to exactly 12 baskets full. Now, let's start out here. At the very beginning of this passage, it said what? It said months later. So the question is, what happened months before? What was happening months before? Well, we find that in the same chapter that we're reading from, that in verses 1 through 6, Jesus had just sent a bunch of his apostles, including his 12 disciples, his little group, you know, um, out into the, the wilderness, out into different, the countryside, out into different towns to preach the good news and to heal the sick. And so our passage, starting in verse 10, 
is sort of a reunion, you could say, okay? They've been gone for months. They come together, and Jesus is like, I am so excited to see you guys. You know, the disciples are filling Jesus in on all of the amazing things that happened. Miracles took place. You know, God was doing things in their presence. And have you ever had a loved one that had been gone for a really long time, and then they came back, and you're just so excited to see them? Have you ever had that, like, that almost butterflies in your stomach, right? Well, you guys, this mama today is so happy because my two older boys, Caden and Connor, are home from college. They're home from school. And so I have had one of these reunion weeks, right, where I'm like, let's all just sit down at the kitchen table. Let's have conversations. And they're all like, Mom, we're busy. We got things happening already. But my mom heart is so excited, so happy because it's been a long time, and I want to connect with them. Well, guess what? Jesus, we see here in this passage, he is no different. It says in verse 10, right, that Jesus wanting to be alone with them, wanting to be alone with the 12, he quietly slipped away with them towards Bethsaida. He quietly slipped away with them. And I want you to see here today, okay, I want you to see here the heart of Jesus, that he wants to be alone with the 12. He wants to hang out with the people that he has missed, so he quietly slips away with them. I love this. So often, you guys, we don't consider the side of Jesus, right? We see in the scripture that he's healing all the people, right? That he's feeding all the people, that he's teaching all the people. He's having like crazy drop the mic moments with the Pharisees, right? And we're like, we like are getting to see all these exciting things that he's doing. And yes, he does a lot of these things, but I don't want you to miss this part of his character, of who he is, is that he desires to quietly slip away with those he loves. And guess what? That's not just the disciples. That's us. That's me. And that's you. He desires for us to quietly slip away with him. And I'm going to challenge you guys today in this house and watching online is that, listen, I want you to know Jesus' heart for you. And may church not be the only time that you quietly slip away with Jesus. Jesus wants to connect with you on a daily basis. Even if it's 10 or 15 minutes, Jesus wants to connect with you. Take time for him. Get up 10 to 15 minutes early because I want you to see here the heart of God is for you. The heart of God is for you. You can give that a hand clap. (laughs) Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Jesus isn't just healing all the people. He desires relationship. And he desires connection. He desires connection. Because this is what I know, okay? This is what I know, (laughs) is that Jesus is there with us, but guess what? The crowds show up. The crowds eventually show up, right? Because it says there in verse 11, but the crowds soon found out about it and took off after him. Don't you just love that? Took off after him. They're like, we know where Jesus is at. When they caught up with Jesus, I love this, he graciously welcomed them all taught them more about God's kingdom realm, and healed all who were sick. Because this is what I know, okay? Guess what happens in life? Even when you leave here, after you leave your little moment with Jesus during the week, guess what? The crowds come. The demands come, right? The stress knocks at the door. The bills have to be paid. The cars need to be fixed. The kids need to be ran to the orthodontist, to the dentist, to the school, to the soccer. But we all love that, right? We love driving around, right? Everywhere we look, there's things that need to be done. The crowds will always there are there. But notice this, is that Jesus graciously welcomed them all. Sometimes I think we think Jesus is in the quiet, still moments with him, but he's not in the crowds and the crazy. No, 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 Jesus is in both. And it's not bad for us to welcome the crazy things that come into our life because it's going to happen. Because even in the middle of those crazy things, you guys, Jesus is still teaching. He's still changing. He's still engaging us. He's still speaking. And so because we see that there in verse 12, because what happens next? It says, as the day wore on, the 12 came to Jesus and told him, it's getting late. You, everybody say you, you should send the crowds away to the surrounding villages and farms to get something, for them to get something to eat and find shelter for the night. There's nothing to eat here in the middle of nowhere. So here begins the famous story of the feeding of the 5,000. And I know what happened. When I started reading this story, some of you who have grown up in church, you're like, 
Oh man, okay, this story. I've, Jen, I have heard this like for 40 years and I've heard it like 500 times. I've heard pastors preach about it in all different ways, but can I tell you what? May we never get, may it never get old to us reading these stories because guess what? The word of God, scripture, it isn't just you read it once and you know what happened. The word of God is living, it's breathing, it's active and when we are reading it and we want to be taught by it, Guess what? We will learn. We will learn. And so I don't want you to check out on me today because I'm reading from the the, the feeding of the 5,000. No, no, no. Scoot to the edge of your seat and be like, all right, Jesus, what do you have for me today? What do you have for me today? Because his word is powerful, living and breathing. I love that. So here, right, are our mighty 12 that just did miracles. Remember, they just did miracles and wonders out being on their own for months, okay? Then they come to Jesus, and this is what I love. They've noticed a problem. They've discerned that there is a need that is heading their way. They are what I like to call seers or noticers. What I love about this is that the disciples here in this story, they were being proactive. They were being proactive. They saw a problem. They saw that there was a need that was arising. And do you know this, that as people, as humans, we have this God-given ability to see or sense what is taking place around us. And can I tell you as well, the more you spend those quiet moments with Jesus during the week, and the more you stay planted in this house, guess what? You'll start to hear his voice more and more. And you'll start to see things more and more. It just happens. It's because that's the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and helping us see. You know, I would venture to say that even in this room that there are people who, guess what? You have seen things and you are noticing things in your own world. You see things in your family. You see needs that are in your children, in your church, in your marriage, in relationships, in friendships, in your neighborhood. You see things, you're noticing things. And these are deeply personal things, right, that I guarantee we all, most of us, see. Some of the moms are going, I don't know if my husband sees those things, but that's all right. Just pray for him, okay, and he will. He doesn't see the dishes, right? It's all right. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to put you down today. Um, Anyway, those are personal needs. Those are personal needs, but then can I tell you, there's a whole other level of needs, A whole nother level of needs. Some of you, the Holy Spirit has revealed needs to you that involve other people in the broader context of the world. Maybe you've noticed that there's children who need a home or there's people with addictions and your heart goes out to them. Or maybe you recognize that there's an area of injustice. Or maybe you've noticed the incarcerated, the poor, the hurting, the hungry. Maybe you've noticed that there's single moms all around. Maybe you've noticed that there's a neighbor in your neighborhood that you're like, I I don't know, something, I just see that there's an issue here. Well, guess what? You are not seeing these problems or having these areas tug on your thought for no reason. You're not. You're not seeing those things for no reason. God is up to something. He's up to something. So us seers, us noticers, what do we do when we see a need? What do we do with what we see? Oftentimes, we do what the disciples did, right? I love the line in verse 10, because it says, they spoke to Jesus and said, you, you should send the crowds away and get to get something to eat and find shelter. You do it, Jesus, right? Jesus, we see an issue, we have this problem, so you fix it. You fix my kid. You fix my church. You fix my family. You fix my job. You fix those who are hurting. You fix this situation. You fix the homeless. You fix the the poor. You fix those who are hungry. You do it. Jesus, you do something. Now, well, duh, okay? We can bring these things to God because he is the son of God, right? He is the son of God. Jesus is the solution bringer. It's not bad to ask Jesus to intervene. In fact, we encourage it. That's why you need to be spending time with him on a daily basis. That's when we actually bring these needs to Jesus. 
And we say, Jesus, I see this issue. I see it. I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm going to talk to you about it. He is the Son of God. We can approach him with these things. And I think the disciples did the right thing in bringing the problem to Jesus. And we do this in prayer. So how does Jesus respond to the disciples? What does he say? I love this, right? Short little line. You have the food to feed them. It's shocking. You think about it, okay? They're like, Jesus, here's this issue. It's a big issue, Jesus. Okay, there's lots of people here. All right? And so Jesus responds, you have the food to feed them. Okay? And this is what that means, that guess what? You have what you need for the problem that you see. You have what you need for the problem that you see. You have what you need for the problem that you see. You don't see the thing for no reason, and you also aren't ill-equipped for that. God has you. And I love this because it's so profound. You know, when you actually look at the the original language that this verse was written in, the word you is emphatic, emphasized. That means when Jesus said it, guess it wasn't like, you have what you need. He was like, you, (laughs) you have what you need. You have what you need to feed them. And a lot of us, a lot of us, we have these needs that I just talked about that we see, we've seen them, we've noticed them. And guess what Jesus says to us? You have what you need for the problem that you see. You have it. You know, recently, as I was reading this, I was reading this story, it just, it, This all just kind of took me off guard, and I literally was like, those words you have, you feed them, just leapt off the page to me. Because I see all the needs in my home, in myself, in my neighborhood, in our communities of City First Church, all of the areas at God Behind Bars, I see all of them. There is so much to do, right? Can I get a big amen? There's so much to do, and I see the enormity of the problem. And then I look at Jesus sometimes and I'm like, you fix it. You fix it. But that day when I was reading this, I heard God whisper so kindly to me, oh my girl, you have what you need for the problem that you see. I have equipped you. I have called you. I have given you everything you need for what you see. But then guess what happens? (laughs) I have a response to Jesus. And it's kind of like the response of the disciples, right? They said this. It says, they replied, all we have are these five small loaves of bread and two dried fish. Do you really expect us to go buy food for all these people? There are nearly 5,000 men here with women and children besides. Now listen, they're going to keep that scripture up there because this is the thing. There are three sentences in these verses and there are three protests. There are three protests. The first one is this. Uh, All we have are these five small loaves of bread and two dried fish. This is what I know. When God tells tells me, you have what you need for the problem you see, I always bring him my shortcomings. Always bring him my shortcomings. Don't you see? Jesus, okay, this need that I see in my family, I'm just Jen. All I have is this, these these bread and these dried fish. Who eats that? You know what I mean? Jesus, that is not enough. Then the second protest, right? Do you really expect us to go buy food for all these people? Guess what? We, We place, and the disciples did too, place unrealistic expectations on themselves. Because guess what? Jesus didn't say, go buy food for all these people. He simply said, you have what you need. And oftentimes I do the same thing. I place way too much, the the expectations are just way too high for myself and what I have. And then the third thing they say is there are nearly 5,000 men here with women and children besides. Guess what they did? They emphasized the enormity of the problem. And I do the same thing. You do the same thing. God, it's too big. It's too heavy. It's too much. This child who is wayward, this financial situation, these things I'm dealing with, it is too big. But guess what? Jesus knows that we have the food to feed them. We just don't believe it. We just don't believe it. I don't believe it. 
Doubt, excuses, lies, pressure, and a skewed perspective all cloud the truth, even in the most faith-filled person. Even in the most faith-filled person. Remember that these are the men, listen, you guys, the men that were like, seriously, Jesus, we can't do this. They just spent months on their own seeing miracles. And yet their response is still this. How quickly, you guys, I want you to see this, how quickly we forget who we are with. When Jesus said, I would, I would like to think that I would have been one of those disciples that was like, you guys are with Jesus, you're going to take care of this. But none of them were. We forget who we are with. Do you guys realize, and I hope that you catch this today, and the word of God says very clearly that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells within you. <laughs> dwells within you. You have been equipped for what you see. You have been equipped for what you see. Is it a child that is far from faith, off the rails, and you're just thinking, what do I do here, Jesus? Financial situation, a complex relational issue. How many of you know? Everybody has a complex relational issue. Everybody. I don't know one person who doesn't. Maybe he's called you to be a solution bringer. Some of you girls at original conference, God dropped something in your heart, and now you're going, okay, now what do I do? You have what you need for the problem that you see. You have what you need. And Jesus is simply saying, do you trust me? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? You have access to everything you need for the problem that you see. And then we move on to verse, four, or sorry, verse 14. Verse 14, it says this, right? Oh, this, sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. This is what I see. This is what happens when we kind of get in this situation. Because what Jesus does next is our frame, framework, so how we can start to believe. And what we do in the middle of the heaviness and the load that we have. It says this, that Jesus told his disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. First, Jesus, what does he do? He actually gives us instructions. So when we know that there's an issue, that there's a struggle, that there's something that is bigger than we can handle, guess what? Jesus gave the disciples instructions, and I think he gives us a very similar instruction here. Have them all sit down in groups of 50. And I asked myself as I read this, Jesus, this is so interesting. Why did you do it this way? Have you ever, sometimes when you read the word of God, just pause and go, why does that happen? And ask God, why did you do that? And as I saw this, I really was thinking to myself, do you guys realize that Jesus could have fed the 5,000 any way he chose? They could have all been sitting exactly where they were, just like talking to their neighbor, and then all of a sudden, loaves and fishes popped into their lap. I mean, you dream it up. I'm sure that like Hollywood would have some crazy way. You know, that like all of a sudden the loaves and the fishes just appeared. I mean, it could start raining loaves and fishes, like cloudy with a chance of meatballs. I mean, it could have happened any way. But this is the way Jesus decided to do it. So why does he do that? He instructs them to break the crowd down into 50 because Jesus knows that 5,000 seems way too big to these guys. He says, break it down to 50. Break it down. Make it bite-size. Make it small enough to do something about it. The crowd seems too big but break it down into 50s. So my question for us today is, with the problem you see, what is the next small step? What is the next small step? What can you do today to be the answer to the, the need you see? What can you do today? What can you research on the internet, internet so you can become, you know, do the next step that you want to do. Um, how can you pray? How can you love? How can you reach out? What is something you can do today? Sometimes we become so overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem that we just sit back. And Jesus said to these guys, break it down. Make it small. Quit trying to change the world. Just change, just love the person in front of you. Just love, do something. So every day, what is, the, what is the need that you see? Is your child wayward? Send them a text. I love you. I'm praying for you. That's it. You don't, you guys, you don't have to go preach a five-point sermon or drag them to church to hear the amazing Pastor Jeremy someday. You don't have to do, shoot them a text. You guys, we wake, 
way, we make things way too complicated. Jesus says, break it down. That's our instruction for today. Break it down. The next thing he does is Jesus gives an, us an example. Verses 15 and 16 it says this, after everyone was seated, I love this. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and gazing into the heavenly realm, he gave thanks for the food. Then in the presence of his disciples, he broke off pieces of bread and fish and kept giving more and more to each disciple to give to the crowd. It was multiplying before their eyes. The example of what we do when we're overwhelmed is found in this prayer. And as I was reading, I was struck by Jesus' prayer. Now I know he's the son of God, but can I tell you, when things are overwhelming to me and there's a need that I see that I've noticed, my prayers don't look like Jesus' prayers. My prayers are like, dear heavenly father, do you see what is happening right now? I have got to have your help. God, if you don't show up, I'm gonna look like a fool. God, these people are hangry. If you do not show up, something is gonna happen. And I kind of like just go back and remind God of all the things again. You know, but amen, little girl, amen. But this is what I know. Jesus didn't make the big to-do of the prayer. He simply did this. He gave thanks for the food. Gave thanks for the food. When you're in the middle of needing a miracle from above, when you need God to multiply the food you, need, you have to have to feed people, giving thanks for what you have is a key to the miracle you need. <laughs> giving thanks for what you have is a key to the miracle that you need. So instead of praying the, I mean a desperate prayer isn't bad, you guys. But at some point, let the, let the desperate prayer shift to a prayer of thanksgiving. Father, thank you for the gifts you've given me. It might not seem like enough to me, but when it's placed in your hands, anything can happen. Father, thank you for giving me eyes and a heart to notice this need. And I am grateful that you have given me everything I need for the problem that I see everything I need. I give you what is in my hands. I lift it up to you. I give you what is in my hands. Now you multiply it to bring the solution that is needed. And what does verse 17 say there? So everyone ate until they were filled. And then the, the, the disciples gathered up, right? Twelve baskets full. Guess what? Even when you give out, Jesus can make sure you're taken care of. He's going to make sure. He's going to make sure. With Jesus, your little can help satisfy the need that you see. I pray today that no matter what situation you find yourself in, no matter what you're journeying through, whether, whatever you're seeing, whatever you're noticing in your family, in your neighborhood, no matter what it might be, that you would leave here understanding that Jesus has equipped you for what you need. And he's simply saying, bring the need to me, understand and trust me. Then guess what? Guess what? Just break it down. Just do something today. Just do something small. And then do something small tomorrow. And then do something small the next day. And keep going after that and keep building on it. Break it down. And then guess what? Give thanks for what he has given you. And let's just see what God will do. Guys, I'm telling you, if if this whole church, if everybody watching online, like, I mean, seriously, like thousands and thousands and thousands of people watching, if we can all get this and have an understanding that the things that God has, that we've been noticing, that we've seen, that we have what we need through the power of Jesus, it's not us anyway. Jesus is the one that feeds the people. We just simply need to go, I trust you. I believe if we can grasp this and then we can just begin to make those small steps of breaking it down and giving thanks. God will change our communities. Things will be different. So let me pray for us this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I come into your presence today and I thank you so much for my friends. I thank you so much, God, that you have created us to be seers and noticers. You have, 
And God, all throughout this room, God, in every location and online, no matter where people are watching, God, you've dropped things in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is showing us and teaching us. And God, we simply just say we choose to believe today that you, we have what we need for the problem that we see. We simply give it to you today. We bring it to you and we do ask you to fix it. But then God, when you look back at us and say you have the food to feed them, we choose to believe it and we choose to break it down and we choose to give thanks and we choose to take that next step. I pray encouragement and strength into my friends today. I pray that you would give them exactly what they need, that they would know that they are equipped for whatever situation they find themselves in today. In Jesus' name, and if I could just have you guys keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you are in this place or watching us online or one of our locations and you have never made Jesus the leader and the forgiver of your life, you've never even thought to bring your problems to him before, maybe you have in the past and then you walked away, I want you to know that today can be your day where you simply come back to Jesus or for the first time you say, Jesus, I don't want to do this on my own. I don't want to do this on my own. So if that's you and you're in this place and you say, Jen, today, I would like to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life. I want to make, I've tried doing this thing on my own. It just hasn't worked. And so I choose today to surrender my life to him. No matter where you're at, you want to just slip up your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But today, by you raising your hand, I see those hands. By you raising your hand, you're simply saying, guess what? guess what? Today is different. I'm choosing to follow Jesus. And so can we do this? If I could have everyone, you can put your hands down. Everyone pray this prayer after me. So that way those who are making this decision, they don't feel alone, that they know that there's an army of people behind them. Can we pray this prayer all together? Dear Jesus, today I choose to make you the leader and forgiver of my life. I'm tired of doing things on my own. I receive your forgiveness, your grace, and your love today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we give those who prayed that prayer a huge hand clap?